Telling you, if I don't get my hot meal at the end of the day, I swear I'm gonna. Oh, hello, welcome to Reverse Gear. In today's show, we'll be going back in time to take a look at the first motoring accident. We'll also be talking to Paul Harris about his time on the undrivables and the tools of being a driving instructor. We'll also be talking to an ex traffic sergeant who served in the, in the police force for more than 30 years. But first, we were set the challenge to find the best affordable diesel car for the first time buyer. And you know what, Ross? I think I got this in the bag. Really? You think? Yeah, I'm pretty confident. In fact, let's take a look and see how I got on. Welcome to lovely North Greenwich. Now, not only is this the very place where we started to measure time as we know it, but it's also home to distinguished um, building sites and students. Now, we're here to show you guys, the viewers, what kind of car you can aspire to own. Let me introduce you to the 2000 Ford Fiesta. Now under this glamorous blue dress, she boasts a mighty 1.8 turbo diesel injection engine with a manual gearbox. Now this leviathan of an engine will have you traveling up to 60 miles per hour in a mere 13.8 seconds with its imposing 73 brake horsepower. Well, probably. The Fiesta was still Britain's best-selling super mini in 2001 by which time it was making use of a design over a decade old, although it was heavily updated both visually and mechanically. In its three-door form, it was sold alongside the fifth generation of Fiesta between April and December 2002. And then in its final years in Brazil, it was sold as the Fiesta Street until 2006. In 2010, the sixth generation Fiesta Mark IV was introduced worldwide making it the first Fiesta model to be sold in North America since the Fiesta Mark I was discontinued at the end of 1980. Ford have indeed improved it with an updated look from the previous range, with a better interior package and aforementioned new 1.6 petrol and 1.8 turbo diesel models. However, it has still inherited the rear seat that you can hardly pack three drunken friends in, along with a boot that will struggle to take more than one big suitcase. And as far as interior design goes, it's not winning any awards, and the words functional and affordable come to mind, but all these can be forgiven given that the car is so lightweight and comfortable, making it perfect for short commutes and running around a city. I think that was all right, really. A nifty little motor, perfect for a first time buyer. We'll see how Ross got on later. Good luck topping that, Ross. Yeah. I doubt I'll be able to do that now, but before that, I'm here with Paul Harris. He's a driving instructor with many years of experience and was one of the featured instructors on ITV's The Undrivables. Hi, Paul. Hi, Ross. Uh, so, obviously, you were featured on the TV show, but what's the worst experience you've ever had on the roads? I think one of the worst things I ever saw and have had to deal with was um, with the people on a lesson going under a roundabout um, underneath the A14 dual carriageway and a car was reversing at quite high speed down the slip road straight in the, into the roundabout towards us. I had to grab the wheel, jump on the brakes, people just panicked and I just had to take over. Sounds like terror on the A14 then, very St Edmunds. Um, so obviously you were a featured driving instructor on the undrivables. I think we've got a quick clip of that now, so let's take a look. Some of the country's top instructors say they can fix them, but they've only got one week. Clearly, Sean is in need of a top instructor. Thankfully, Paul is a pass master. Well, we haven't crashed yet, Sean, have we? We have not. Always think positive. We've come close. I go the extra mile for my pupils. If I had 100 people, I'd like to think that 100 people would pass. That's great stuff. So, I mean, how was your experience working with those drivers on the TV show? 
Well, it was obviously a real challenge because you're taking someone out in a car that you've never seen drive, but you know by their track record that they're pretty awesome at driving badly. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously you work with a lot of uh, learners. What would you say the biggest mistakes that first-time drivers make? How long have you got? <laughs> well, basically when they first start, it's clutch control, steering, gears, road positioning, MSM routine. Um, but it's also their decision-making skills. You know, they're coming out of a junction. They can't really judge the speed and distance of opposing traffic and very often make a wrong decision. So we have to take over. Yeah, so I suppose these skills take a long time to train. We're, but on the TV show, you only have five dates. However, if you only have five minutes, what are the most essential pieces of information you could pass on to learner drivers? I think one of the most important things is concentration, total concentration. Don't be distracted by things inside the car or outside the car. And the other skill, of course, which takes a long time to learn is anticipation. Trying to realise what can possibly happen before it really does. So, whilst trying to juggle all those skills, learner drivers also have to battle with nerves. A lot of them overcome it in their lessons because they're sitting next to yourself like, as the instructor. But when it comes to the test, they all fail sometimes on nerves. Um, have you got any advice for drivers who are failing because of nerves in the test? Yeah, it never ceases to amaze me how they change from just ha being cool and calm on a driving lesson and then just terrified and a gibbering wreck on a driving test. I would tell all my pupils, you've done all the hard work. All the hard work is the hours and hours of practice, practicing the routines and procedures, emerging at junctions, dealing with meeting and crossing traffic. Just go there you know, full of confidence. You've done all the hard work. Examiners are really nice, people-friendly people now. It's far more relaxed. Yeah, as I say, like on my exam, ground the gears a couple of times, but mm. there was no like, you know, there was no frown, frowning upon, no. which was good. I mean, like going from nerves now to probably the most confident people, we, we, they like to think so, boy racers. Have you ever dealt with them before and how do you tame them? Well, I can see it sometimes in, in my pupils. Some of the lads do just want to go foot down and go for it, which is great. It's a sign of confidence, but sometimes we have to try and get inside the head and train the attitude and get them to realise the dangers of speed at the wrong times and the wrong places. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, as a driving instructor, you have your personal struggles with students, but do you still struggle with anything within the driving aspect of instructing? I think one of the most difficult things to deal with is aggression from other road users. Um, people very often tailgate a learner driver. I mean, I had an incident the other day in a supermarket just teaching a girl to Bay Park and a woman came up alongside flailing her arms around and I could read her lips and she was swearing like mad. Totally unnecessary. Give learners space. You were a learner once, weren't you? Exactly. I mean, like, you know, I suppose it can work both ways. Yeah. Get respect from elders to youngers and youngers yeah. to elders. I mean, like, with situations like that, do you ever get angry or find yourself frustrated with people? No, I have to lead by example. You have to stay cool and calm and just totally ignore it, which, is, which can be very difficult. Cool as a cucumber. Well, that's all we've got time for today, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks. OK, so we've learnt how and how not to drive a car from Paul, but as we all know too well, there can be serious consequences for when it goes wrong. We're now going to go back a couple of centuries where speeds we consider today to be dangerously slow were, in fact, dangerously fast. Let's take a look. It was here at Crystal Palace in 1896 where Bridget Driscoll, then 44, was the very first victim of a road traffic accident involving a pedestrian. As she crossed Dolphin Terrace, she was struck by a Roger Benz, which actually belonged to the Anglo-French Motor Car Company. The driver, Arthur Edsel, rang his bell, shouted, and swerved the vehicle. However, unfortunately, Mrs. Driscoll died from a head injury just moments after impact. Now, at the time of impact, the car was only traveling at four miles per hour, and a witness at the time, Florence Ashmore, described this as a tremendous pace, as fast as a good horse could gallop. After the inquest, Mrs. Driscoll's death was determined to be accidental, with the coroner stating that he'd hoped such an event would never happen again. Unfortunately, almost 1,700 people were killed on the roads in the UK in 2013. But this was actually the lowest number since records began. Much lower, in fact, than the highest mortality rate of 9,200 recorded in 1941. Now, of those 1,700 people, 388 were killed by exceeding the speed limit and driving too fast for the road conditions. The number of deaths began to decline rapidly in the mid-60s, especially because of the introduction of traffic calming measures since the 80s. 
Now these included things like permitting speed bumps in residential areas and determining appropriate speed limits. Thanks in part to an increase in both regulation and enforcement of new road law and the education of drivers, we've noticed a massive reduction in both fatality and accident rate here in the UK. And that's why roads here in the UK are considered amongst the safest in all of Europe. We have a different Paul in the studio with us now. Paul Ward this time. He's a retired police officer of 30 years and we're going to chat to him about some of his experiences dealing with drivers. Paul, thanks a lot for joining us on Reverse Gear today. You're welcome. Let me, let me start by asking you maybe to tell me a little bit about yourself. I mean, what made you decide to join the force? 22 years old, working in an office, and I just looking for something more interesting, more exciting. My dad was a traffic cop, so I suppose it was in the genes, really. Yeah, running the family. Yeah. Um, now, earlier in the show, we, we heard from Paul Harris on, on what he had to say regarding learner drivers and road safety. You must have had your fair share of road safety issues. Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we were experiencing disproportionate number of incidents and crashes and so on involving young drivers, elderly drivers, motorcyclists and so on. And so we were looking to sort of, you know, really effectively target through enforcement and education, you know, the groups of people that we, fi we fig or figured were, you know, sort of forming, you know, the... Uh, those groups, you know. What about learner drivers in particular? Well, learner drivers, I mean, you know, once, once they're, well, whilst they were, you know, with an instructor, with a parent and so on, there's a certain element of control there. But once they pass their test, of course, that changes and then they're out with friends and perhaps driving in different environments, so motorway driving, nighttime driving, country roads, that type of thing. And, of course, the combination of those factors can, can obviously bring on sort of a, a nasty incident. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, actually, we just had a look at the first road death caused by uh, an increased speed limit o on the roads, obviously. And, and recently, the government had plans to, well, actually, they, they cancelled plans to increase the national speed limit from 70 miles per hour to 80 miles per hour. What are your thoughts on that? I'm glad that they did. I mean, from a road safety perspective, I mean, to increase the, increase the speed, you know, that means, you know, on motorways and so on, it takes longer to stop when things go wrong. Um, you've still got uh, the human element. I mean, we've got safer cars, but the human element, you're looking to people to be able to respond and deal with incidents. And if you've got less time, there's less safety. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, you know, I want to talk a little bit about, I mean, obviously you've been on the force for, you know, 30 years, as we said. You must have seen your fair share of ridiculous incidents. I mean, what's the most absurd thing that you've seen? As you say, I mean, I've seen an awful lot of stuff that's quite, probably quite crazy to, you know, uh, lorry drivers driving along with their feet out the window, driving on auto. Wait, so they've got their feet out the window whilst they're driving? Yeah, yeah. So obviously set it to automatic or on, on the speed limiter or whatever and driving along, wow. when, you know window open. Are these uh, things even legal? Wow. Well, of course not, you know, and uh, other drivers preparing hot food and meals, watching TV, wow. using a laptop, you know, whilst driving. You can't believe this stuff, but uh, we've seen it <laughs> and dealt with it. Well, I'm, I guess you're glad that you're retired now, but, but, but given that you are retired now, there must be some aspects you miss. I miss that sort of being able to sort of obviously have some real hands on to sort of try and improve road safety uh, in my part of the world. I don't mind admitting, I, you know, I miss sort of being able to respond in a high performance car to these incidents and so on. But uh, nice stuff, good one. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for joining us on Reverse Gear. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. But uh, Ross, over to you. So earlier on in the show, we were challenged to find a diesel engine car fit for the first timer. We've seen Nitten's attempt. Whoa, 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 what are you talking about? The Fiesta was great. It's not really a head turner, is it, mate? Well, I doubt you're going to do any better. You're useless at finding cars. <laughs> well, I wouldn't be so sure. Let's take a look and see what I've got. Today, I'm in a top secret location, deep in the heart of Essex, on a typical English summer's day, to take a look at the brand new Mercedes SLK 250. <laughs> AMG has been a major player in the automotive industry, finely tuning Mercedes cars since 1967.
It wasn't until 1990 when Mercedes and AMG partnered for full cooperation on all Mercedes sports cars. All of Mercedes AMG cars have been full on petrol head cars, designed for performance and speed, until now. In 2011, AMG redesigned Mercedes SLK 250, adding the first diesel sports car to its range. Boasting a 2 litre turbocharged engine outputting 201 brake horsepower, 1500 kilowatts for you modern folk out there. The AMG SLK 250 takes you from 0 to 60 in 6.7 seconds. Starting from £37,000, it's pricey. However, due to it being a diesel and an AMG sports car, it has the best of both worlds. 56.5 miles per gallon and a top speed of 152 miles per hour. All in all, it's a breath of fresh air to the roads to the market. However, it needs a little bit more work before it is a must have. There we are. I think it's safe to say I won that one. Hold up. I'm sorry, Ross. What are you going on about? What part of that car was suitable for this challenge? <laughs> it had a diesel engine. It's a Mercedes. So? A Mercedes is not suitable for a first-time buyer. No one ever mentioned how much money the first-time buyer had. That's rubbish. This is for students. I win. There we go. Anyway, that's all we have time for today. <laughs> a special thanks to our guests, Paul Harris and Paul Ward. We'll be sure to fasten our seatbelts and use our indicators. You can reach us on Twitter at hashtag reverse gear. Thank you for watching and good night.